I'm Dave Gentry, Small Stocks Big Money. I have with me today Pana Sharma, a good friend and the CEO of Lantern Pharma. Pana, thanks for being with us today. Uh, Dave, always great to be here. Thanks for having me down. Thank, thanks for coming. Radar is changing the landscape of how we find drugs, develop drugs, repurpose drugs. Your, your AI platform has 200 plus uh, oncology focused data points. 200 machine learning algorithms. You have three uh, clinical trials in process, three different drugs, and you have 11 FDA designated programs. And then you started this company, I believe this was where you came into CEOs roughly five years ago. Yeah, at the end of 2018, 2019. So, so give us an overview of the technology of the platform and what you're most excited about. I mean, we could not have made this progress. And I was just talking to some of our board members about this without the extensive use of AI and certainly not with the kind of burn rate that we have, which is fairly de minimis compared to other biotechs. We are a data-driven company and really that data-driven idea has morphed into really being an AI-first company. But our focus is AI for good and our AI for good is to create cancer medicines. And so we use data and AI to understand and develop molecules, but also to understand how a molecule can be used best. Which cancer will it work best in? Where do we have a propensity of evidence? Where can we de-risk it? Where is it going to work better than other drugs? You always hear about, wow, this drug worked, but then it never gets through a trial. It's not because it's a bad molecule, but it was poorly understood because the standard of care is always changing, right? And just because something works doesn't mean it's going to work enough to get to an approval. Just because something works in lab doesn't mean it's going to work in the real world setting. Just because something works by itself doesn't mean it's going to work in a patient who's now third line and may or may not have those biomarkers or mutations available to target. The real world is, is chaos, right? And so that's what, when we accumulate data, we can think through, does the beauty of the science that we have, does it translate into the chaos of cancer biology? Does it translate into things that'll be meaningful, durable impacts? And so far for our drugs, we've been very fortunate that we actually have some really good responses. So you have a phase two uh, asset for never smokers lung cancer, uh, which is a $4 billion market opportunity. You've had some data. Talk to us about that program and what the challenges are and what, what the endpoints are. Yeah. I think initially the challenge often was to get the data that shows stunningly that people who don't smoke actually have a different disease when they get lung cancer. The molecular profile, totally different. The mutational overlap is no overlap. People who have, who are smokers have different sets of mutations. People who are never smokers have different sets, quiet mutations almost. So they have a very low tumor mutation burden. And so they're, but they manifest themselves in the lining of the lungs as an adenocarcinoma in the lungs. So they're both classified as a non-small cell lung cancer, but they're treated the same. Unfortunately, never smokers really don't have any approved therapies targeting never smokers. Now, we do know that never smokers tend to have a preponderance of kinase mutations. So these kinase mutations are totally different than what a typical smoker has. And so that's how our drug works. And we, that, we found that through AI. There was some data out there, but AI molecular modeling helped us to understand that the drug that small molecule, P300, actually bound to those very specific kinase receptors. And those kinase receptors are available to us in these never smokers. So we target the biology that's specific to that patient group. And when we went into the trials, it worked out. All these different types of kinase mutations, it's the only pan kinase modulator that's in clinical trials. So this trials. is what we mean by precision yes. oncology, yeah. right? That's um, right? Because you're able to look at the, the signature biomarkers and uh, target those for which the drug will work. And also have, and have predictions about it. I mean, we can argue about predictions all day long. Eventually, you'll get into a trial. But we've had, like you said, we've had a complete response in the target lesions of one of our patients. It was a 71-year-old male who failed four prior lines of therapy, including Keytruda, including chemo doublet, including Tegriso, which is a great drug, osimertinib. Failed those. And his response was over two years. So it's not just like... What are next steps in the clinical trial? We'll have some data coming out. Um, that'll be um, an extension of all the patients in the U.S., plus the first group of patients in Japan and Taiwan. And so I'm hoping that this trend will continue. In the first group of patients, we had an 86% clinical benefit rate, which is pretty phenomenal. 
And that's what gave us the hope that, hey, let's keep spending, let's keep pushing this. And I think if we get similar type of numbers in the second readout, that's going to pave a path for a lot of partnerships with big pharma. It's also going to potentially pave the path for an accelerated type approval with the FDA. Is it your intention to partner then with this, as you said, with the phase two data or take it yourself if necessary? Yeah, we're, 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 we know our space. We're innovators. We like to trade stuff. We'd like to prove that it works. We'd like to put and then sell it off to a larger biotech or a larger pharma and allow them to do what they do best, which is manage global phase three trials, get it into insurance companies' hands, get, get it reimbursed for, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we think, obviously, you know, we've got to make projections, and I, I think this drug could easily be in the 4 to $5 billion range annual, annual sales. Right. And this is in a disease where there's not many great options. Let's talk about uh, your second drug in clinical trials. Uh, just completed a phase one. It's a small molecule synthetic that uh, targets the DNA uh, damage repair deficiencies uh, with an application towards pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, CNS. Talk to us about this program. Yeah, this is a very exciting one. About 25% of all cancers have some kind of DNA repair deficiency. And our drug, LP184, is what one you're mentioning. It has uh, four orphan indications in pancreatic. It's been fast-tracked as well, correct? And fast-tracked in GBM and also in triple negative breast cancer. And again, this drug is first in human, totally advanced with AI. And we just finished a phase one trial of 63 patients. So it's a fairly large trial and it's a very potent drug. So we started a very, very low dose. So to work our way to the maximum tolerated dose and then do dose finding. So we feel like we've got a really robust phase two recommendation. And I think we'll, we'll achieve that. We've got two phase twos lined up, maybe three now actually that are cleared from the FDA. So this is a blockbuster drug, 10, 12, 15 billion in potential sales annually. And it's because it really destroys a wide range of tumors, but only if that tumor has a DNA repair deficiency, which again, about 25% of tumors do, or the cancer overexpresses a certain RNA sequence called PTGR1. And if that's overexpressed, downstream PTGR1 is overexpressed as an enzyme. And our drug binds to this enzyme inside of the cancer cell. So the beauty of this drug, again, going back to your precision oncology, it's been, it's designed to go inside the cancer cell, but not activate until it binds with this enzyme, PTGR1. PTGR1 doesn't really exist outside of the cancer cell. So it's off target effects. The applications are breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, bladder cancer, and CNS. Pancreatic cancer, CNS. Fast track on, on that, a 10 fast track on that, a $10 billion market. Let's go to your, your third drug in clinical trials. Uh, this is a drug for blood cancer. Tell yeah. us about it. So this drug, we didn't even have when we went public. You know, so we started brainstorming this drug. This is the first in human, brand new molecule, never was worked on. But we really started working on it partly because of 184. So it's kind of a sister drug to 184. And it's called 284. And 284 does the same thing that 184 does. It destroys cancer cells. But this destroys blood cancer cells. Because 184 wasn't working in blood cancer. And so they give us that moment of like, well, what, why does it not? And so as we explored that, we said, let's use the mechanism of 184, but see what we can do in different cancers where 184 doesn't work. And that's the birth of 284. 284 has two orphan indications, one in mantle cell lymphoma, one in high-grade B cell lymphomas. It also actually works remarkably well in certain sarcomas, which probably do the same reason, which is the, the targets B cells. It's a B cell depleter. If there's a CD19 or CD20 positive B cell, this drug destroys it. And that, those are indicated in a lot of different B cell cancers. And so uh, we had a great, complete metabolic response in a patient two doses. And so that gives us a real clarity of signal. This drug is doing something. This is a patient who was very advanced. They had failed three prior lines of therapy, state-of-the-art therapies, a bispecific antibody. Um, they had a, um, a stem cell transplant, and they also had a CAR-T therapy. So top-line therapies for these, for lymphomas, uh, state-of-the-art therapies. And so um, where there was a lot of debate internally about whether this patient would, would 
even respond, you know, given that they hadn't responded all that well historically. And so we were just amazed and surprised. And so we're, we're pretty hopeful. We, that clearly shows that the mechanism that we modeled using our AI platform and the data that we discovered in the, the de-risking that we did is valid. So the, to us, the AI platform is working. And that's one, and more importantly, we're actually impacting this patient's life. And so to us, that's what AI for good is about. Uh, so the results have been amazing. And in your $48 million market cap today, um, there are analysts out there saying your stock should be $25. What's, uh, what's the disconnect? Uh, I think the disconnect is about $22. <laughs> so, uh, you know, biotech's been through a very difficult time, it's, you know, not just our company, all companies. And so, um, it's great not to be trading in cash, but the thing is the market opportunity is pretty significant. Any one of our molecules could be licensed, partnered, even co-developed. It would be worth several times our market cap. So I think as we continue to put out good data from our trials and we continue to advance the platform, we're doing both at the same time. And so we have like two big engines. And oftentimes the bigger disconnect is you have the tech guys who don't understand trials and biotech and are scared of it. And you have biotech guys who don't really understand the AI engine and say, well, we don't understand how you're doing all this. We don't believe you. How can you do three trials? How can you come up with these three drugs and you're only spending four and a half million? So the disconnect is that you have you have an entrenched way of thinking from the biotech world and you have a uneasiness in the tech world because we're actually trying to change lives and outcomes and not just do intellectual masturbation about, you know, LLMs and flips and parameters. That's all great because we use that and that's how we do all this great work. But just doing that doesn't make you a genius. It doesn't make you change lives. You got to actually change a life. And so I think partly the disconnect is that you know, one, biotech has been challenged and we're coming out of that. Second, there's a certain element of disbelief in the biotech community that how can a, this small company do all this stuff and it takes our company $100 million a quarter and we're, you know, we're belly up. And I think that, I think that's just a, something that needs to get worked through. But I think that's, in those disconnects, that's where opportunity is. Right, right. right. Well, I've watched you grow the company the last five years and watch you get these three drugs into clinical trials. And I've, I've watched you manage your cash quite well. I think you've raised well over $100 million, right? Yeah, publicly and private. Publicly north of 97, by 97. Fairly substantial VC funds backed this, so they saw what, what you saw, right? Yeah. And what you see today. And this is just the beginning. I mean, we don't even talk a lot about all the exciting new developments that we have. We're really focused now on our trials and getting these initial drugs out to larger pharma customers, partners. And then also we have a pretty big initiative that we're working on with the AI platform that will, uh, that this will come out this fall, which will be really breakthrough. We're taking a page out of the kind of the deep seek playbook. And so that'll be quite, I think, uh, uh, eye opening for the industry. That's exciting. Pana. I want to uh, thank you for, uh, coming into the studio today and sharing your thinking and your story with us. It's exciting. It is. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. 